You have your fruit unto sanctification and the end life everlasting. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. By looking at your calendar, hopefully last week, you recognized that Friday was the feast of Saint Anne. And if you were here last night, you would have heard me preach a small sermon about some of the about some of the life of Saint Anne. And with that, I wanted to talk a little bit more today about this good saint, but in a way outside of just her life, but in a way and about a devotion perhaps you haven't necessarily heard of. Now I know that this area of the country is much more uh, much more uh, ethnic, ethnically German and Polish, but for any of you who ha may have a little bit of French blood, you are probably familiar with the fact that Saint Anne is one of the patrons of the country of France. In fact, the French cherish Saint Anne so much that they that they brought her along with themselves. They brought her as a, the patron to French Canada in Quebec with Saint Anne de Beaupre, and then they continued to bring her even down to Acadia in Louisiana, and where she was is part of the patronage down there, and there's a national shrine set up to her in Louisiana as well. The French love Saint Anne. Well, why is that? It's it's because that there is uh, that Saint Anne chose France for herself. I mean, it all started, of course, because she is the the mother of the Blessed Virgin Mary, which earned her a large amount of devotion to begin with. But she chose the French in the end, and they embraced her. For, for as their patron. In the 17th century, there was a farmer named Eva Nicolasik, and he lived in a small little village that was called the Kerana, which in the, 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 the Britain tongue was, means Anne's village. And for, for his part, he was just a simple man. He couldn't read, he couldn't write. He was a simple, humble farmer who worked very hard on his land, but also had a reputation for being a very pious man in, his, in all of his simplicity. But every day he would go about his daily work around the farm, and every day he would make sure to remember the patron of his town, St. Anne. He would pray to her, and he would think of her throughout his toils. Well, one day he was coming back to the house after a long day's work, and it was now dark. And as he approached the house, he saw before him, illuminating the doorstep and the interior, an arm with a torch in its hand. And as he walked in, he noticed that it, it lighted his way all the way to his room. Now, just before this had appeared, he had been praying as he walked back, a little devotion, to St. Anne. He didn't make the connection at all, but he realized that this was quite a phenomenon to see. Arm suspended in the air, holding a torch, lighting his house. Well, he moved on, and the next day he continued about his business. But this same vision would occur to him several more times in the days to come. At times when he would be walking through the village at night, all of a sudden there it would be again. He'd, he'd start saying his prayers to St. Anne as he walked, and a, an arm would appear in the air holding a torch, lighting the ways of the streets through the small village, and kept helping him all the way home. And he didn't know what to make of this vision, but it never frightened him every single time he saw it. In fact, it had the opposite effect, seeing that he that it came about during the times when he was praying to this patron, she he would he would increase his devotions because he saw it as a sign that Anne wanted him to be more devoted to her. And finally, one day, another was able to share in seeing what he saw. He was at his house and he's inside the, the house 
and his brother-in-law was visiting, and they were both standing by the window, and they looked out over to the field. It was dark outside, but they looked to the field that, that, that he took care of, and there, out in the dark, they saw a white woman, and she radiated, and she carried a candle, and she was walking through the field of his property. They, together, had no idea what the purpose of this was, but every vision continued to increase his devotion, till finally, on the vigil of St. Anne's feast day, that night, he was walking home, and he got the beginning of his answer. He was leaving from the, the, the town center back to his house, and when and he started to pray to St. Anne, and all of a sudden appeared to him that same woman dressed all in white. And she began to speak to him, and she said, Eve, Nicola, Nicolasic, don't be afraid. I'm Anne, mother of Mary. Tell your priest that in the piece of land called the Boceno, there was once a chapel in my name. I want it to be rebuilt as soon as possible, and that you take care of it because God desires that I be honored here. Now, the Boceno that St. Anne spoke of, it was part of Eve's property, and it was a small section of land on his, in the field that, strangely enough, the oxen would refuse to enter into and refuse to plow. And so it had all this overgrowth, and it was hard to take care of because no animal would enter into this small parcel. And there was also an ancient tradition that had gone around the townsfolk there that at one point in time, Somewhere in that area, there was indeed a chapel that had existed and that was dedicated to St. Anne, but nobody really knew where and nobody really knew whatever became of it because there was not much ever left of it in the end. So Eve, being obedient to the vision that he had, followed, had seen, he, the next morning, went to his parish priest and he told him everything that he had seen up to that point, the hand in the air with the torch, the, the, the vision of the light, white lady walking through the field, and then finally the, the, his seeing the woman and her, the words that she spoke to him in the street the night before. The priest listened and was very respectful to me. He knew that he wasn't a crazy man, and he also knew that he was a very pious man. But in his prudence, he was very hesitant to throw his weight, uh, his belief, behind something so extraordinary. And so he told Eve that he would pray about it, and that he would want to see more evidence that this was indeed coming from heaven. Well, Eve, he couldn't do anything about it other than to return to his duties and to continue up his devotions to St. Anne. And that proof came in the way of an additional vision on March 7, 1625. St. Anne appeared again, and she told him that, that he was to get all of his neighbors together at his house, and that they were to follow the torch which he had seen previously. Well, he right away obeyed the, the instructions of St. Anne. He went out and knocked on his neighbor's doors, called them to his home, told them that something extraordinary was going to happen, and made that leap of faith and brought them to his house. And there they were all gathered together, and sure enough, in a little while, that arm appeared in the air, holding that torch all again. And he said, this is what St. Anne told me would happen. Now let's follow where it guides us. So they went out into the field and they followed the torch and it brought them to the Boceno and, and then it stopped over a very specific point in that field. And when they had uh, realized it was indicating that spot, they dug around in the brambles and the brush and found there, underneath it all, an old statue of St. Anne. It was the original statue from the chapel that had once existed and had been talked about in the, amongst the town people of, of having been once in the, the village. And so Eve picked up the statue, seeing that it was truly a sign of heaven uh, wanting this to be done, and he erected a little shrine on the spot, set the statue up there in a place of honor. And every day he would go out and say prayers to St. Anne. Three days later, all of a sudden, word had spread, and people were coming from all over to come and pay homage to the mother of the Blessed Virgin Mary. On that spot, pilgrims began, began coming in in droves. The priests of the parish realized now 
this truly was a sign from heaven, and he commissioned a chapel to be erected again on that place. St. Anne's statue was enshrined in that chapel, and it um, and mass began to be celebrated in that location. The shrine of St. Anne in that little village took on the title of St. Anne Gore after the larger town in the area, and now is the third most popular pilgrimage spot in all of France after Lourdes and La Salette. It has remained to be such because she is that heavenly patron of the entire country and of the entire people of France. Now, we too have patron saints. And we often, when thinking about them, when I think about you know, my own patron saints, I think about how they have come to me via perhaps a few different means. Either they were chosen for me by my parents in the, the way that I have names, you know, like Steve and Francis for myself. And so I know that those names were chosen for me by my, by my parents. Or it's a name that I've chosen for myself in the way that one would for their confirmation saint. Or perhaps when I think about my own ethnicity, then I have a saint that is given to that ethnicity, so St. Patrick for the Irish, for instance. Or uh, if there is a patron saint of a church that I attend, St. Hugh, or a town that I live in, whatever it may be, those things are given to me just because of where I come from. Yet we forget that that choosing is a two-way street. We, yes, indeed, choose our patron saints, or we choose them for our children, but in reality, those saints in heaven have chosen us as well. They've chosen us to be our guardians, to be our aides, to be that the, our protectors in this life. And in return, what God wants from us is for us to honor them for their fidelity, and their virtues in their lives. Our Lord wants us to turn to them for intercession in our times of need. He wants us to read and to learn about their lives so that we may better imitate their virtues. He wants our patron saints to be a daily part of our lives. It's not mere accident that we have them as our patrons. They truly are a heavenly caregiver for us. And by being devoted to them, by making sure that we have prayers to them and that we know about their lives and we learn more about them and we turn to them when we most need it, we are ensuring that we always have a heavenly friend, a heavenly patron, a heavenly aid to guide us all the days of our life long. And by their helpful intercession, we will obtain those same heavenly reward that they have obtained for themselves so long before. That's why we have patron saints. That's why we give them the honor. They are our aid in heaven. They stand before the throne of God. And they ask Him all the help that we need to help us save our souls one day. And God bless them. Father, in some way, you are surrendering.